Put yourself back in the 1960s, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, people are driving sure. really big cars, very inefficient, you know, people don't have big computers, yeah. they're talking about going to the moon, it's a different world. Just try to put yourself in the mind of George Stigler, who actually got a Nobel Prize for many of these things. Okay, well welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about search, and um, it's going to kind of move into high, a little bit higher gear and maybe use the the multimedia functionality more. I don't like to do slides. Uh, it's better for me to work slowly and you can ask questions and I've done this a few years now so I think I can, I've got a, a, an approach that you might like. Um, this is because the search, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to actually look under the under the hood of the search model that we just described previously as, as, as running into people randomly and, and in case of um, an acceptable match, which was always the case in the Pissarese model and also the Mortensen Pissarese model, um, that we would have a match and then production would be possible. And then the only reason you would break up would be for some random reason. Well, the rest of the course is going to deal with a fancier way of approaching this. So you're going to, we're going to think about um, why uh, people would like to perhaps decide at some point whether. Uh, to continue or not continue uh, looking for something and under what conditions maybe um, we can describe it in a, in a, in a conceptual way that, that is susceptible to the methods we have. Uh, we've, we've, we've learned in other courses and maybe in this course as well. Okay, so this is an important lecture. I'm going to introduce some new concepts as well. So the plan uh, today will be to look at the um, last session very briefly and talk about the, the MP model which is I consider it to be kind of an important landmark in this area. It's, it's kind of a bridge to macroeconomics. And then I'd like to discuss the microeconomic foundations of search theory uh, by start, starting with non-sequential search. There's supposed to be an E in there, sorry about that. Um, and then I'm going to define uh, what the profession seems to believe still is a superior alternative, which is sequential search. Again, we'll define both of those terms in detail. Um, when time comes. Okay, so last time we talked about the Martins Pizzerides model. Uh, in the section, you've had some some more discussion of it. Um, I'd like to just leave you with some thoughts. We, it, is a, it is a useful laboratory for thinking about lots of different questions, not just about labor markets, but also about macroeconomics in general. So looking at policy interventions on the in the labor market, but also policy interventions that affect the way um, workers. Um, and firms interact in the way firms actually uh, market products and look for customers. This model can be applied to a lot of different uh, uh, contexts. A lot of them have little to do with labor. So uh, in macro, um, one can use this model to think about um, bankers looking for loan opportunities, uh, frictions in credit markets, frictions in product markets, maybe some some products are easier or harder to sell than others. So this is another way of uh, getting our heads around reasons why sometimes markets don't clear perfectly and, and the rest. Okay? Um, there are a lot of ambiguities in this model, as you already saw. We saw a lot of the comparative statics effects uh, that we could derive with a lot of, t with a lot of effort um, are often uh, not unambiguous, which tells you you should be very careful thinking about uh, institutions that people hold dear, uh, like job protection or rent control or perhaps uh, um, any, any number of things that um, affect the supply of or the demand of um, laborers or goods in a, in a certain uh, friction, frictional uh, market. Um, and I thought this was interesting because a lot of people say Job protection, for example, is always a, a bad thing. Um, in this MP model, it actually has an ambiguous effect on unemployment. So, and if you think hard about it, it makes sense. Uh, if you have um, a very high cost of separating from a worker, this will reduce the number of, of separations. It will also affect a firm's willingness at the margin to enter the market and look for a worker. So the, uh, finding out the, the net effect of those two uh, on unemployment um, requires a bit of um, a bit of deeper analysis, looking at the relevant functions, what's the efficiency of matching, what does the matching function look like, 
how big are the, are the severance costs? Um, are there other things that may offset it? So it's an, it's an ambiguous outcome. On the other hand, it's pretty clear that in this model, this MP model, the institution of job protection in the sense of taxing separations has an effect on GDP in the economy. So it will actually reduce the number of productive, productive matches in the economy. That's a pretty unambiguous outcome. So um, we should be careful uh, not to take unambiguity or ambiguity too far. There are some things that you can say. The productivity of an economy that has very severe job protection may actually be lower because um, new innovative processes um, tend to um, fall by the wayside more frequently. There's less entry and, and the like. So it's, um, it's really a question of thinking very hard about the model um, and looking carefully at the, at the parameterization of the model. Um, you can learn a lot from looking at, at this um, and also other types of job um, market, labor market reforms like the, the Hartz reforms. You can learn uh, the, the, the discussion in Germany right now is actually quite, quite controversial about whether um, the reduction in unemployment and the increase in jobs was more due to the, the dealing, the way the unemployment benefit was reformed or whether it had to do with uh, the uh, bargaining position of, of unions or possibly even increasing the incentives to participate in the labor market. Okay. Um, we learned that the wage is probably not flexible, but it is in the martinson Pissarides model. Okay, so that's a, a, an issue that one has to think about. Uh, a lot of people have criticized the, the martinson Pissarides model for that reason, and it's difficult to, to know exactly what kind of rigidity you want to put into the model, uh, make it difficult for, um, for workers and firms to renegotiate it every, at every instant, maybe just introducing a little cost um, would produce a, a band of inaction. Or you might just wonder if the, the fallback positions of the two respective parties are actually quite close to, to each other, so the surplus doesn't move very much. There are also a no, number of ways to make the model a bit more consistent with the data, because the data seem to say that wages move a lot m less in the data than they do in the mortensen pissarese model, and the quantities move a lot more. So. Unemployment vacancies uh, move in the opposite direction. That's what we call the beverage curve empirically. And uh, you'd expect that in this model if productivity moves. But um, if wages are kind of rigid, you, have, you do a better job um, actually accounting for that volatile um, unemployment vacancy, vacancy unemployment ratio. Okay. And another criticism of the MP model is it's really not a great way to think about the distribution of wages. So if you, um, if you remember, the, the wage is not constant um, across time for a given match, and it's also not a constant at a point in time across, across uh, workers who are working. Because some workers may have started um, at one, productivity of one, and may have a very good wage, high wage, and of course, um, after some time, the wages um, may change because of uh, adverse productivity realizations, and as a result, you have a distribution of wages. And this distribution of wages is actually stable in, in the Morton Simplicity's model, and actually, in certain, certain conditions, can be derived. It has a, a mathematical form, but it's not at all like what we observe in the data. Okay, so that's just another criticism. Don't take this model too seriously. You can you can change the MP model to account for these these weaknesses, and some people have done that. You can assume that productivity, as it's realized, has a certain um, instead of being uniform across the interval, it might have a, a normal distribution. The original the original model had a had a normal distribution, so it's very easy to uh, sorry a, a, a uniform distribution. And uniform distribution means that the, the density function is constant across the entire interval of possible productivity. So the, it's, a, it's actually very tractable to play with for, for students and for, for uh, people who want to think about these different, different types of interventions. But in fact, if you want to actually match the distribution of wages in, in the economy, you'll have to do um, a bit more thinking about, the, about reality. Okay? And of course, we. The household labor supply decision in this model is, is very simple. The, the, the workers are basically out there 
They don't decide whether to enter the labor force or not. They're in the labor force, and either they're employed or they're unemployed. Um, and their behavior, and the behavior of firms, reflects the assumption of risk neutrality. And that's probably not an uh, extremely realistic um, place to, to end, but it's a good place to start. So, okay, so remember, these are, in, these are like little atoms moving through a, like in brownian motion in a liquid, and they sort of run into each other. And that was kind of the way we think about the firms and the workers in this, in this setup. And it has certain characteristics that are not so far off the idea of uh, random uh, encounters, etc. And of course, in, in the real world, firms have more than one worker. Okay, the Morton Spitzer's model assumes constant returns to scale. So if you, if you think about it, it doesn't really matter whether you put three fir workers and three firms together and call that a big firm. There's no productivity improvement or gain from being big or small. So the, the, the Morton Spitzer's model is sort of based on um, this scalability assumption. So it doesn't really matter whether you, you can think of each um, job looking for a worker, you can think of each job being a firm or a personnel department of the rest, but there's no assumption about being bigger or smaller is, is advantageous or disadvantageous. Okay, so we can improve on this. There are lots of different uh, papers that you can look at. I mentioned some of them already. The, the Den Han paper looks at um, starting at a different um, place when you start, when you meet, you encounter the the worker as a firm, when you're as a firm encountering the, the uh, a worker encountering a firm, and you can basically also reject, you don't have to accept. So you can imagine a, um, a reservation um, productivity in the model actually being higher than the productivity you draw upon your first encounter, and that gives us right into the, into the subject of today's lecture. Um, I won't discuss this. Actually, I'm, I have a paper where I show with a colleague that putting um, sort of rigidities in the old-fashioned sense, having unions and employers associations can also help explain the, the volatility of, of wages across um, job matches. Okay, so there's a lot of, a lot of tricks you can use to get, um, to get wage rigidity in the model and get more realistic outcomes. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, micro-foundations of search. We're going to have to go through a few um, basic facts about probability theory, um, uh, what, a, what a density is, what a cumulative distribution function is. We're going to think about integrations, mathematical operation, to get from one to the other. We're going to talk about um, um, some tricks that we'll need to use to move forward. And the idea is simply the following. We have now a distribution of, of possible outcomes. When you put your hand in the urn, you actually pull out something. And you have a, a pretty good idea of what the distribution of that outcome is, but you're not going to know what you have in the hand until you actually do it, until you actually draw it. And drawing it may involve a cost. Okay, so that's the most important idea behind theory, the theory of search. And um, I'd like to start by just giving you some background on, on where search theory comes from. The, the original idea, um, the Nobel Prize um, laureate um, Stigler basically uh, thought of search as just another economic pro economic decision. So his idea was, you're look, you're at a fair, or you're at a, you're at the at the marketplace, you're at uh, um, Nondorfplatz, and you're looking for some cheese. Okay, you're looking for a uh, and there are lots of cheese stands in the Ondo plots, okay? So you, 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 you're deciding, you're still sitting in the S-Bahn, you're going there and you're deciding, okay, how many, how many um, stands am I going to visit, um, given that every time I visit a stand, I have to pay some cost. I have to walk over there and I have to talk to these people, ask them, you know, maybe these stands are very far apart, um, and the rest. So. Stigler's idea back in the 1960s was, and he was thinking about the job market, but we're going we're gonna to phrase this in terms of the, of the product market. So something you and I can, can deal with. We're like shopping for something. We're going to look for some cheese at Nordorfplatz. We've got to find out, um, you know, we're going to decide how many stands to visit. And we just want to get the cheapest cheese. Make it really easy. We're looking for, this. We're looking for um, you know, Emmentaler cheese. But there's several different stands, and we're kind of 
stingy and we really care about getting the lowest price. Okay, so Stigler's idea was maybe um, the way to model this is to think about a distribution of the price, which is independent of the stand that you visit. So it's just a, it's a random event. You go to a stand and you ask the guy, okay, what's, what's, what's your price? He's going to say, well, it's 10 euros a, a kilogram, or it's you know, 8 euros a kilogram, or whatever. I, don't, I have no idea. It could be a lot higher. And, um, but you have an idea already. You've been to the Nondorf Platz many times. You actually know what the distribution of prices is. And all these guys are independent. So it could just, it's just basically a random, it's a random event. So Stigler's question was, how many stands should I visit? Should I go to five? Should I go to ten? Should I go to one? Okay, and the idea is while you're sitting in the S-Bahn, you're, you're solving this problem, and you're going to write down the number of stands I'm going to visit. And you formulate that as, a, as, an, as an optimization problem. That was Stigler's idea back in 1961 and 62, and he actually got quite a bit of mileage for that because no one had thought about it in those terms before. This is a Chicago approach to, to looking for something, okay? Economics of uncertainty, looking for something that's random. It's random. Okay, so his problem really is, is about the following. Okay, what is the expected value? Um, and I'm choosing n. n is an integer number of visits to the store. So we're, we're going to take this very seriously, but we can, we can also make it a continuous problem. We'll think of n as an integer, the number of, of stands I'm going to visit at the Nondorf Platz. And then um, I'm going to write this, I'm still in the S-Bahn, I'm trying to figure out what's the optimal number of stores or stands I'm going to visit. And then I'm going to execute my plan when I get to the Nondorf Platz. Okay. And what's going to happen is, you know, I'm going to visit, <laughs> I'm going to visit these n stores and I'm going to choose the one that's the lowest. So there's another implicit assumption, which is I can actually um, nail the guy, you know, are you going to, really, eight, eight euros a kilogram, fine, I'll uh, do the rest of my visits and I'll come back and you're the cheapest. Okay, so that's another, another interesting aspect of this problem that we're not going to talk about, but um, you'll see in a second it's already kind of an interesting problem. How many, how many cheese stands do I visit um, and whether I actually follow through with what I planned. But the idea is you're going to visit um, and you know, nowadays we have something like this already. We have the internet. You can do you can do simultaneous search. Some people you know use bots to do this. You know there are all sorts of clever clever things. I don't do that. But um, Stigler's idea was you take the decision ex ante and then you follow through with it. Okay. So this is a this is a, a problem I'd like to talk to you about right now. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write down Stigler's problem in detail. Okay. So. We'll click right to the cut to the quick here and see if this see if this works. Okay, so Stigler's problem. Short question. Yeah. Is Stigler's problem. Does Stigler's optimize? Stigler, not Stigler. Stigler. That's a Next different thing. Yeah, a different sure, number sure. of The Stigler optimizes his, uh, the stands he wants to visit after every stand he visits. No, no, no. You have to listen to what I said. He's in the S bahn and he's writing okay. down how many different stands he's going to visit. And then he does it. Okay? So again, put yourself back in the 1960s. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. People are driving sure. really big cars, very inefficient. You know, people don't have big computers. Yeah. They're talking about going to the moon. It's a different world. Okay? <laughs> so just try to put yourself in the mind of, of, of um, George Stigler, who actually got a Nobel Prize for many of these things, not just for this. But um, and I'm going to try to formulate that. And then we're going we're gonna to see why it's not the end of the story. It's part of the story, because mm. a lot of people think that his stuff is coming back now. And there, are, there is some discussion of whether this type of non-sequential search is actually the right way to go. But right now, we have to understand what the intellectual history was. Okay, so let's write down Stigler's problem. And I'm going to apologize in advance if the thing starts to jump around because I, I'm still not used to working this, 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 uh, this notebook with the stylus function. So, Basically, it's, it's about choosing, see, I told you, choose n, and n is the number, it's an integer, and 
basically we're when I say choose n, each each one of these um, each one of these draws means visiting a stand. It means pulling pulling a um, a price from a distribution that's common to all the stands. And the density function for that distribution is p is f. And p is the random variable, and it's distributed. Um, on the interval zero, if you're really lucky, the guy gives you the cheese for free. And if you're unlucky, um, it's going to be P upper bar. So I'm going to take a, a max. Okay, so if you want, let's use the, the formal notation. It's coming from this continuous interval, and F, little f of P is the density function. And capital F will be the CDF, and I'll define all that stuff in a second. You had a question? Okay, I thought you were raising your hand. All right, so th think of this as the density um, function of the price, and it's drawn from invariant distribution. So it doesn't depend on the stand, it doesn't depend on the time of the day. It's just it's a constant function, and um, we're going to use that to, to derive the probability of getting a price that is at some value or below or at some value or above. And remember you're searching you're searching for price. So unlike labor, when we, when we flip this next week and talk about labor, you're gonna be looking for the best wage you can get, the highest wage offer, conditional on other things, you're gonna be trying to maximize your expected income. But um, to make this kind of sufficiently flexible, I want you to think about this as a price problem. We're actually trying to get the lowest price. So like everybody can deal with that. You don't even have to be a worker you can get that, okay? So you're going to choose n, but n comes uh, at a cost, okay? So the, basically for every visit to a stand, you have to pay C. So the cost to you in total for n visits to, uh, to stands will cost you n times C, and C is a constant, okay? So this is called the support of the distribution, this interval. So in, in labor, we often think about wages coming from a distribution, and um, it, there may be a minimum wage, or there may be some, um, maybe very low wage, maybe zero. And this price thing, again, you could get the cheese for free if you're lucky, but you're probably not going to get it for free. You're probably going to pay. And uh, the probability of getting that low price is going to be um, useful to know, but you have to know F to get that. Okay, so that's that's important. So let's let's. Um, Let's use this information to move forward on this. So I'm going to have to recalibrate this pen. Every time I touch it, it kind of, kind of freaks out on me. But, okay, so what's the probability that I get a P that's less than P prime? So that's an easy, just to get you, get you, get you up on probability theory. Um, what's the probability? that P is less than some arbitrary value P prime. Okay, so P prime is like a 10. What's that probability going to be? Given this minimal information I've given to you, we can already figure it out. F is a continuous distribution. Let's say the the Microsoft uh, version of this computer was much better than this one. It's probably just a matter of sensitivity. So what is that probability? Anybody? It's going to involve an integral. Okay, so we're going to have to integrate something. And you said it's from 0 to P prime. Okay. If I can draw that, <laughs> um, yeah, this is of what? Of F P P P. F P F of P. And then this is. There you go. Okay? 
So this is, um, I'm going to use a shorthand. Remember, um, this, is a, this is a density function, but we could also write that in terms of a, a distribution function, or the, the distribution function, which is defined the same way, right? It's defined as the, the probability of observing a, a p that's less than or equal to p prime. So that's also going to be f of p prime. Okay. So again, it's just simple probability theory. And um, we also use another type of notation, which might be interesting to you, which the search people use a lot, which is, it's a shorthand, df of p. Okay, so you're basically, um, you may think of f as the integral of little f, so df, uh, of p is like f of p, little f of p, dp. Okay, so this is a, these are equivalent, you know, notational forms. For some reason, search theory loves this one, so we'll be using this quite a bit in the course. Okay, so the, it's also just easier to write down. Okay, so f is the cumulative distribution, and df is the density. It's a notational thing. Okay, so what do we know about f? f is this cumulative density, a cumulative distribution function, it's deriving from little f, and we can say the following. What can we say about, what is the probability of, of observing zero? Little f is continuous. It's like the, le <laughs> the lowest price, like getting it for free. So the probability of getting it for free is pretty low. In fact, it's zero. Okay. So that's equal to zero. And if you take, if you thought, well, okay, let's, let's try a p that's just a little bit greater than zero, then you'd get a little bit of positive mass on that, and there's a small probability you might get it for like five cents. It's like when you go to a bakery, they're about to close, they're just giving away the bridge, and they're not really giving them away, but you, they're cheap. Like you go to a spate and the guy's like selling the, the Turkish uh, pizza for like one tenth of the price you pay. Okay, that's a rare event. Okay, so what's the other extreme? What is the what is the probability? What is the, the CDF of, of of the upper bound? Okay, so you're always going to observe something that's less than or equal to the top of the of the um, of the de of the um, of the um, support. We call that the support. Okay, since so again, just to just to calibrate your knowledge here, and this is really a super problem here. What's going? What's going on with my Taiwanese? I think I'm going to try something really fancy. I'm going to try to put it like this and see if that makes a difference. It's not good for you, mm. but it might be good for me. <laughs> Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Okay, so what is the expected value of the price? Okay? call this the unconditional expected value, expectation. So I'm not telling you anything. Um, you're just going to go to the first stand and you're going to, the guy's going to call out a price to you. It's coming from the same distribution. So how would you figure that out? We know the density, the left. So we take the integral from the lower bound to the top bound, to the upper bound of the, of the support. And we take P times D of capital F of P, or P F of P DP. It's amazing how bad this pin is. Okay. Okay, that's just a yeah, I can't see it. Can you see it from the back? No. 
The problem is if I get close to the edge, it doesn't like it for some reason. Uh, so this is probably better for you. I can maybe I can keep scrolling up. Alright. Alright, so that's important. That's an important fact to know. And um, I'm going to show you something that uh, requires a little bit of... You have to put on your, your calculus hat from when you were in high school again. Maybe you all had some math. So we're going to try to... There's another way to write this formula, which is also useful to us. Okay. And, and doing so, I'm going to use what's called integration by parts. Okay. So keep this in mind. Take this guy seriously. And there's this thing called integration by parts, which means that if I have two functions, and I'm going to write in the general form without bounds of integration, so it's u dv, I can write that. If I know what u is, u is a function, and v is a function, and dv is something I can derive, then I can write that in a special way. I can actually rewrite it. Does anybody remember that formula? Integration by parts is really useful in search theory because we have a lot of times we have integrals that we can't really evaluate. We need like a little trick. We're going to rewrite it in a different way. And if we can do that, you're in business. So it's, not, it's like like a game, like how to fool the fool the problem. Anybody remember integration by parts? Tai integration. <laughs> what is that? It's called uh, engineers. Okay. Try uv minus the integral of v du. Okay, so go home and try that out. I mean, take u equals x squared and v equals uh, uh, x uh, to the third power, and then just try to integrate that product and, and see what happens. It's, it, it's kind of neat the way that works. Okay, so I'm going to use this formula. I'm going to apply it to this problem to 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 write this integral in a slightly different way. Okay, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let p be my u. And I'm gonna let df d cap f be my dv. This may be pressure sensitive. Maybe that's why it's just not pressing hard enough. Yeah, they have that setting, which I didn't check. Okay, so if we use the integration by parts formula, then the integral, no, that's certainly not the problem. So, Okay, so uv would be p times f, okay, of p. Minus, and what would um, v du be? Maybe the integral of f of um, p at the top end of the, of the screen. Okay. So what have I done? I've written, I've written this integral, and I'm going to put bounds on it now. I'm going to go from zero to p upper bar, zero to p upper bar, zero. 
Okay, we can evaluate that. Um, what is F at P upper bar? It's 1. What is F of 0? It's 0. Okay, so this piece is P times 1 minus 0 just equals P. Okay, this one is something we're going to just hold in the back, back of our hand for a second. But it's interesting to see what it is. It's, it, involves, it involves the an integral of the CDF. Okay. But it turns out that you can also think about this guy. This is just the this should be the P up right here. Okay. So that's equal to P, but what does that thing is equal to? What is P bar equal to? P, P bar is equal to... It's the integral... from 0 to P upper bar... I think I just have to move very slowly. DP. It's the definition of integration. Okay, so if you... If you integrate dp from 0 to p upper bar, it's p upper bar minus 0 is equal to p bar. Okay? And I've still got this guy. I've got to subtract going from the same bounds of integration from 0 to p upper bar. It's a 0, by the way. Of f p dp. Okay? Now remember, integration over the common bounds of integration of two, uh, two functions is the integral over the common bounds of integration of the difference between those two functions. Okay, so you're subtracting uh, the first, from the first term to the second term, so we can rewrite that as the integral from 0 to p of a bar of 1 minus f of p dp. Okay, so this is a pretty important formula for finding, it's an alternative way of finding the mean of a function with a density, a uh, random variable with a, with a density little f. Okay, so it would be the integral of 1 minus the CDF uh, over the same uh, support. Okay, so this is a, this is a formula that Stigler used in his, in his famous uh, derivation that we're about to do. Okay, so this is kind of a a nice way to introduce you to this, um, to using this notation, and again, this is the expectation, the con unconditional expectation, if you want, we use this, this symbol E uh, of, of P. So you should remember this. this is, um, again, we're asking the question, how many stands do I have to visit, or would I like to visit, to minimize what? I want to minimize my expected price. Given that I'm going to visit n stands, what is the minimum? It's an extreme, kind of extreme value problem. What is the minimum value? And I wrote that on the slide before. So we can actually we can write that out a bit more formally. Um, I'll, write the, I'll write it in English first. Question? How many stands, cheese stands, remember we're talking about cheese. We can also be talking about how many websites do you want to visit. Every time you visit a website, it takes five minutes to work your way through. But Stickler is sitting in his, in his bus or S-Bahn, whatever, thinking about how many times should I do this before I actually get going, okay? So it's like you sitting in front of the computer. How many websites do I want to visit before I decide what? flight to take to Mallorca or something. Okay, it's the same kind of idea. You can see that it sounds like a cool idea, but it may not be exactly the right idea. So that's, that's the whole point. That's why I'm doing, spending all this time to talk about this. So how many stands do I visit? I hope nobody visits this website. <laughs> I hope nobody visits this film. This is turning out to be a terrible ad for ASUS computers. 
<laughs> I really tried hard. You know, we've got the we've got the most economical one because uh, our provider was like who told us we had to, so I got this one. Do I visit? And this is N. Okay, so that's the, that's my decision variable to minimize. Listen, folks, listen. I'm only going to pay once. I'm only going to buy one kilo of cheese. I'm not going to buy 15 different kilos. I'm going to choose. N visits to get the cheapest price I can get in this market. So it's not, it's not as true as you think. Okay. To minimize, let me just finish writing it and we can talk about it, okay? Minimize my expected price. And this is ex ante, it's before I even get off the S-bahn. Because remember, we've already, we've already derived the expected price for one, but we've, we're now are choosing how many times to go. So it's a little bit tricky because we only we're only going to take the cheapest the cheapest offer. We're not going to take any offer. So it's not as easy as you think. Okay. So that means um, this means I'm looking at something like men of P1, P2, dot, 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 comma, Pn. Okay, so n is a, we're going to assume that n is, you know, it could be 1, but it's possibly bigger than 1, but it's an integer. Okay, and I'm going to take the expected value of that. is not a good ad for this company, I tell you. They're probably going to sue me now. <laughs> okay, so formally, now you had a question. Who had the question? Yeah. Now you had, she had a question. But you're next. <laughs> you had a question? No? Okay. Um, so, uh, if we could scroll up to yeah. the This here, because you evaluate the, um, you're evaluating this expression. Every time I touch it, it's going to show. There's going to be a mark on it, so I have to be very careful. I'm evaluating this expression at p bar, upper bar, and then I'm evaluating it at zero. Okay, uh -huh. that's the, that's the. When you evaluate an integral, you take the top and the bottom, and that difference is the value of the integral. So, but isn't that where the 1 minus 0 comes from? And then it's p times the integral evaluated at p bar and 0? Well, f, f at p bar is 1, and f of 0 is 0. Right. So, 1, 0, and then you're multiplying it by this p, because that p is there as well. Yeah, oh, so well, isn't, shouldn't it just be p times 1 minus 0 then, rather than p bar? No, because you're plugging in these, these bounds of integration in the values um, that are in the expression. So oh, p okay. is a general expression, and p bar, upper bar is the, is the upper bound of integration, and 0 is the lower bound of integration. Okay, so that's... Um, I knew this would be useful, and that's why I'm doing very. I'm going slowly, and I'm going to get a better computer next time, and then we're going to do this. Do this right. Um, all right. So I'm, again, I'm still I'm horsing around this problem. This is just the. This is what I'm trying to minimize, but I have to worry about paying the cost. I pay. I pay C every time I visit one of those stands. So I have to subtract that. So I could get a great price, but I may have visited every store on, in the fair, and I'm just out of money because I'm literally paying for every, I'm paying resources, time, energy, uh, patience, whatever, uh, for every visit. Okay, so the real problem is not just that, you have to take it net of the cost, C. Okay, so it's going to be NC. So my problem formally is min uh, choosing N from the set of integers, okay, of a bunch of, of two things. One is the it's, oh, it's crazy. 
two things. One is the, the price, and then NC. And since I'm choosing N, and I know what C is, that's a deterministic part. Everything else is kind of random. Okay, so if I take this expectation of the sum, it's really like asking, let's evaluate the expected value of the minimum price. And I think I'll put a, I'll put a min here just to make sure you understand this is a, an optimized thing. And then I'm going to basically take a look at all those prices that I get after I've visited those N stores, and I'm going to take them in. Okay. So that's the same thing as asking. To make this very, very, go very slowly. Um, we're asking the, the expected value of min of, of these P1, P2, dot, 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 Pn plus. plus NC. Maybe getting hot is a problem. Okay, so let's let's to, to tackle that we're gonna have to figure out what the distribution of the minimum price is. Okay, so it's not just uh, it's not as trivial as you think. We have to you're asking what is the probability of, of getting a price that is lower than or equal to some value. So we have to derive and I'm going to take it very slowly. I'm going to have to derive this minimum value density function for this to characterize this expected value. Because n is cho chosen, c is known. So the expected value really probably kind of rests on this thing. So let's, let's, take, let's take ourselves through the simple, suppose I, and again, you, you choose n, but we can just we can play through all the different possibilities. Play through the possibility of, if you just, <laughs> decided to go to one store and just take whatever price you get. That's one possibility. Or if you choose two. So now let's think hard about what the distribution of the minimum price is if you visit two independent stands. Okay? Does anybody want to give it a try? It's, it's kind of tricky. Let's put it, so try question, try two visits. Okay, so what's the probability that neither of the prices is less than some value p? Again, p is just some, some critical value. What's the probability that neither of the two cheese prices is less than p? Using the notation we've used already. Okay, they're independent. Maybe I should do that. Use my um, use my hand. So, what is the probability? <laughs> what is the probability? That. Maybe the problem is that you're no. touching the, the screen with your hand while writing. Yeah, I turned that off though. It's supposed to be. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's supposed to, maybe maybe it rebooted and reset it to the old. That's possible. But if if I try to figure that out, I'll have to stop the lecture. I don't. But next time. No. What is the probability? And I'll, I'll fix this up for you because I post these on, online, so you can. What is the probability? Um, see, I don't think that's right because I'm not even touching it. I'm, yeah, still, yeah. I'm still not getting anything. What is the probability <laughs> that that neither price is less than? See if I move up. Still doesn't. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, so anybody want to try it? Use the big F, the capital F, the density, the distribution, CDF function. What's the problem with it? that one price is greater than F? We just derived it, kind of. It's one minus the probability that it's less, okay? So it's one minus. I'm so proud of myself getting this new computer. You know this. Okay. That's the probability that the price I pull from this cheese stand is actually greater than P. Okay? And the probability that both cheese stands I visit are greater than P is going to be 1 minus F of P times 1 minus F of P. It's like bad luck. I go to two cheese stands and the guy wants 15 euros a kilo. Just bad luck. One, one's 15, the other one's 14. Okay? And if, if my P is 10, then I'm out of luck. Okay? So again, every, P, the P here is just any price you choose. You can use that as a, possibly for a dummy variable integration. So um, three visits, what do you think? What's the probability of three times striking out if, I, if my reservation price were P? It must be the cube, right? Okay, so we have the square, we have the cube. So for three visits, I'm just agonizing here. It's three visits. And again, he's pulling P1, P, P, again. He pulls P1, P2, P3. And what's the problem that all three of those guys exceed some arbitrary value P? That's going to be. 1 minus, watch this, I'm going to copy this, and let's see it down here. Isn't that cute? And again, and now I'm going to erase one. Who do you guys, huh? Okay, so that's, it's the cube, right? So obviously for n visits, it's the nth power. Okay? So for n visits, 1 minus f of p to the nth power. Okay? So now I'm, I'm almost in business. I know that if I go, if I visit um, n different stands, the probability of suppose suppose p is equal to 10, 10 euros. The probability of getting a, all three or all n uh, draws greater than 10 is that expression. So remember, one minus f is less than one. So that as you get as n gets higher and higher, this number gets smaller and smaller. So the chance of getting a good price actually rise, right? So that's a that's kind of one way of thinking about the extreme um, value distribution. So you can think of the probability, um, or like the, the, the minimum value, the density, this is, this is also the, the, the distribution function for the minimal value of choosing a price, um, sampling a price with n different samples. Um, and therefore, this minimum expression that we had before, this one, Is a very nice. Watch this. I'm just going to erase all this. I'm so clever. <laughs> okay. It's going to be. Still have to use a rag at some point. It's going to be going from zero to the top of the density of this um, CDF, implicitly of the. Um, the minimal price of um, n draws. OK. 
Okay, so it's going to be basically, so I think this is kind of the, the density, the probability of getting a draw uh, that's at least as, or it is no greater than P. Okay, so that's the, Stigler's problem was basically um, looking at this probability and asking, okay, now what, um, given that I get to choose N, and as n goes up, you can show that as n goes up, that expression uh, gets smaller and smaller. So I'm, as I sample more uh, stands, I'm getting a lower price, um, if you like it, a lower expected price of the minimum value of those n draws. But every time I do it, I have to pay n uh, times c. Every time I do it, I have to pay c, and thus I have to pay n c. So Stigler's, Stigler's solution, Stigler proposes, Choosing n star, and you can't use calculus because you can't visit a cheese stand uh, two thirds of the time. So n has to be an integer. So Stigler was basically saying, okay, well then I'm sitting in my S-bahn trying to decide how many times I go to these cheese stands, how many visits. I'm going to take I'm going to take the costs, um, the expected gain. Okay, how much do I gain from visiting one more stand? And I'm going to compare that with C. Every time I visit another stand, I have to pay C. It's constant. So what is the marginal gain of a, of a discrete decision to visit yet another stand? Okay, so that's, a, that's kind of a straightforward problem. So he, he defines by, he defines, um, he compares the gain, okay, which is the change in the expected value of the, of the price, I'm going to call this. I'm going to call this um, M for n visits. So this is the expected So this is the this is the expected minimum price given that I visit n. So I'm going to compare, when I decide to go n times, I'm comparing m for n with m for n minus 1. Okay, so I'm comparing n minus 1 visits plus the expected minimum price for that strategy, and I'm going to compare that with doing one more visit. So he defines, so he defines this gain as m, because remember, the more visits you have, the lower the expected price. Every time you visit, a, you plan in the S-Bahn to visit another cheese stand, you're going to get a lower expected price because you're just, you're sampling again and you're always, you can always throw away the bad, the bad draws. So you're just getting a better, a better um, chance of getting what you want. So he defines this gain, okay, so that's the price, the price gain versus C because if you visit the, that extra stand, you have to pay C. Okay. And basically, you will choose Why don't we put a plus here to make it even more intuitive for you? <laughs> um, if I can. Okay, so you're deciding whether, you know, um, you'll basically choose n that satisfies the following expression. will be the it'll n that puts you between, but the cost is just between the gain you'd have from another. Gn is greater than the 
greater than or equal to C, and C is greater than or equal to the gain of N plus 1. So what I had before was correct, actually. So let's go back here and put this. This, this is a minus one. This is correct. Okay, so this is the basically you're going to choose you're going to choose n such that the cost of visiting one more stand exceeds the expected gain from visiting that stand. That was in this particular condition, but it's it's certainly justified by the previous visit. Okay, so remember the gain is a monotonic function of the number of visits to the stand. And the more visits to the stands you have, the, lo the lower the expected price. Okay, so Stigler shows he showed that as the cost goes up, and this was one of his big findings in the in the sixties, early sixties, the cost goes up, then people are obviously going to make fewer visits to stands. Okay, so if, if um, to, to use the analogy of Waldorf Platz, if, if the, if the um, each visit to a stand costs more time, you have to do more negotiating, or it's just painful, or whatever, it's, it's big distances between the stands, that would reduce the number of, the optimally decided discrete number of visits that you would make at the, at the, at the, um, at the marketplace. Okay, but more, more important, Stigler shows Stigler shows that the spread of F is important. So what is the spread of F? It's kind of a, a way of talking about the variance of the underlying distribution holding the mean constant. So it's an old-fashioned expression that they used back in the 1960s. Now we talk about stochastic dominance. But the most important thing is, imagine an exper thought experiment. You're at the, at the, the, you know the cheese price on average in the fair is the same. So the integral of 1 minus F of P uh, D is the same. DP is the same. It's constant. But you know that in this other marketplace at uh, Mexico Platz, there's, there's much more variance. So the chance of getting a really low price is, is high. It's higher. Or the spread is higher. Okay? And if the spread goes up, then what do you think? It's kind of intuitive. If you're comparing Mexico Platz with Nondorf Platz, and you know that the spread of cheese prices at Mexico Platz is higher. Would you search more or less at Mexico Platz? More often. Right, because you, there's a really good chance you're going to hit that lo that that low that low price. Okay, so that was that's kind of a a more important finding. That I think other things kind of common sense. And you know, Stinger was was an economist who studied the economics of information. A lot of what he got his Nobel Prize for was for that. But he shows that the spread of the distribution will affect your ex ante decision to search more intensely. So in the 1960s, this was a big, this was a big finding. And labor markets uh, in the United States were really tight. Okay, so unemployment was about as low as it is today in, in, in America. And a lot of people said uh, certain racial groups, certain uh, demographic groups have high unemployment. It must be because they're not taking it seriously. They're not they're lazy, okay, they're being picky. And Stigler was trying to, to draw inference on, on that. And of course, you could also say maybe it's because they have a problem getting an offer, okay, it could also be other things. But he was saying that some people facing a labor market where uh, maybe there's discrimination, maybe it would induce them to actually search harder because they may just be getting screwed by some person that they meet, so they'll draw more often and possibly find that job, that dream job with the dream wages. Okay, so this is a, this is a different problem, of course, but that's, that's what made this, um, this Stigler idea very popular. also made it very, uh, just very controversial because you can imagine 
Uh, some people are unemployed possibly because they uh, have uh, poor education or their industry is going out of business and to blame um, their unemployment on being choosy was, was kind of controversial. But remember we saw that unemployment has very different ways of looking of being looked at. You can think of a, a voluntary unemployment, these people just don't want to work, they're not even looking for a job, or they are looking for a job, but they're not getting the job they want, or maybe the labor market just won't clear and the wages that they would normally get in the labor market um, are higher than their productivity and the firms don't want to hire them. So there are all these different perspectives. The search theory perspective would say that it has to do with people's st search strategy. Okay? So now, um, I'm sorry about the, the computer technology, but then we have to discuss why this is um, a bad idea. Okay, so Stigler made this incredible set of, uh, wrote this incredible set of papers, got lots of uh, discussion, a lot of criticism. People thought he was he was a great economist, but still, um, he was very controversial, very opinionated. Okay, so the question is, why would you criticize this model? Okay, you could also say, well, you could say, well, but the distribution of price may be different across stands. That's a cheap shot. Everybody knows that, right? But suppose you've never been to this place before. You've never been to this market. You just—it's it's all Greek to me. So I just go to the first, the first one. I want. Yeah. I think you forgot the arrows. Right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and when I write the notes up, I'll show you. It's actually easy if you remember the formula and you know how to do differentiation under the integral sign, it's easy to show that, okay? But that's a different question. Yeah. yeah. Intuitively, it would make more sense for me to re optimize my decision after every stand I've visited. Very this good. was my question in the beginning because... That's right, and that's exactly the right answer. Okay. And that's called sequential search. Okay, so this is non-sequential search. You're in the S-Bahn, you write down the plan, your program, your optimization problem, it's, it's static. And then you go off and you're searching. And the reason why it's, it's a, probably not a great thing to do is because if, ever, every, if you can only search at one stand at a time, then basically your search... Um, Execution, the search uh, process is, is sequential by nature. You visit one stand, you get a price. Then you go to the next stand, get a price. So here's, the, here's what Stigler didn't think about, and he was criticized by Dale Mortensen. Okay, our friend Dale Mortensen. I actually visited our university back in the 90s when I first came. Mortensen and a guy named McCall, who was more of an operations research guy. So these guys, both guys, sort of jumped on this Stigler idea and said, this can't be right. And, and what you said is interesting, but you got to say it in the right way. The problem is, you wrote down the number of times you're going to, number of visits you're going to make. Say it's six. I'm going to visit six cheese stands. And suppose I visited the first cheese stand, and I get a really super price. I get two euros a kilo. Can't beat that. That's just it's probably something wrong with cheese, but <laughs> I got lucky. And Stigler would say, you keep on searching. You keep on paying C again and again and again because you said six. You're going to visit six, so you're just throwing your money out the window. You know you're going to go back and get this two euro uh, a kilo of cheese, right? There's just no question about. It. And if he, the you can take the extreme position. You draw the you, you draw the lower bound, there's no, there's no justification for searching anymore, okay? So the, the, the policy is not time consistent in the sense of macroeconomics. Remember macro? When the, when the Fed says they're going to raise interest rates and then Trump comes and then they change their mind? Okay, so I mean, when you change your mind after you've, you've made a promise and you renege on the promise, it's called time inconsistency. So you write down a policy and then you realize, God, I'm stupid, you're not going to do this. It's a waste of money, because I got lucky. So we, we, we think that's probably not the way most people go about doing things. In fact, the way they probably do it is they use a sequential search strategy. And a sequential strategy means you decide, thinking hard about the problem, you have a reservation price. Okay, so you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be going from one stand to the next, it takes time to do it, 
And if I hit it, if I hit my dream price, it doesn't have to be two, it could be five, it could be eight. If I, if I want to go with five, I'm going to be looking a long time. Very, very cheap cheese, unlikely. Eight? Probably, right? But you're going to choose that pop, you're going to choose that reservation value and you're going to keep sampling until you hit eight or lower and then you're going to take it. And that's it. You terminate the process. That's called sequential search. So that requires a bit more um, ammunition, a little bit more thinking. Um, and that's what labor economists have kind of brought to bear on the, the, the problem of searching for a job. Because that sounds more like it is in real life. Okay? And you might say, well, now we have you know, monsterjob, jobmonster.com, whatever it's called. Monsterjob.com? <laughs> I haven't looked for a job in a long time. Um, you know, you could say, well, I visit three sites and then decide getting a simultaneous offer. Most people don't do that. Most people have target employers, they visit them sequentially, have interviews, and if you interview with one, you may get an offer, and you have to decide, okay, whether well, I take it or leave it. And usually those guys don't say, uh, come back and visit me later. Uh, <laughs> so it it's, uh, requires a certain stopping, stopping property of, of the... So that's what these guys did. These guys came up with this idea of sequential search. And I'm going to introduce the problem, and next time I'll go into more detail because it's only 10 minutes. So again, I'm going slowly because this is um, uh, this is worth repeating. Okay. So I'm going to characterize sequential search now. What sequential search does for us. So sequential search. And before we start this yeah. topic, I have a que question: How to choose the n? Because for me, this this inequality with the c and the g n. It's not comparable in the sense that G N is defined as something like probabilities. No, it's the gain. It's the it's, it's the gain, gain in, in the expected price. So, okay. In other words, if, I, if, I just, if I'm sitting in the S bahn again, I keep saying that sitting in the S bahn because it means you, you make the plan before you get off the train. Okay. When you get to the market, then you execute the plan and you mm -hmm. don't change it, and, and that's the whole problem. So, the 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 idea was if I choose N uh, versus N minus one. Okay, if I go, if I visit N stands, uh, the expected yeah. minimum price is going to be something like 850. If I visit nine stands, it's going to be like eight. So the gain would be 50 cents per okay. kilo. And then it depends on how much I want to buy. Obviously, if I want to buy one kilo, then it's 50%, 50 cent gain. Is it worth it? Worth it, the extra foot, you know, shoe leather I have to burn up to, to walk to the other stand. Okay, that's the idea. And, and it's an integer problem. But you know, if you're clever, you can think you can make this a continuous time problem by thinking of n as the intensity or the number of um, millions of, of of searches you do. I mean, there are all sorts of clever ways to make this a continuous variable. But the idea is the same, right? You you want to you're gonna you're gonna basically choose the number of, of visits that just makes you indifferent between going for one more or one less. Okay, and that's. Um, I think it's very intuitive. I think it's more intuitive to do it the, the discrete way than the continuous way. Okay, so remember the fundamental critique, critique of, of non-sequential search. It's not time consistent. So I'm going to try to write down what Mortensen McCall, and I'm really kind of using the, the book by Sargent, Thomas Sargent, and Lundqvist and Sargent, some advanced macroeconomics. The way they've done it is very, very nice and clean. The idea behind sequential search is you, you think of a policy. It's not like an optimal number of visits anymore. I have a policy. The policy is characterized by two things. Okay, so I'm going to write down optimal policy. So you're sitting in the train now, and you're not thinking about the optimal number of visits. You're thinking about my optimal policy, and it consists of two things. Okay? It's, it's characterized by a value function, and we're going to call that V. I'm going to tell you what it is in a second, and a reservation price. So S is the, I'm, I'm moving away from the P notation because P is like a dummy variable of integration for the rest of what I'm going to do. So S is, think of S as the, S is the price of the cheese that I could get right now. I'm, I'm standing in front of this, this cheese uh, dealer, and he's telling me 10. That's my S. And I also have this number in the back of my head, which is a reservation price. 
Okay, it could be eight. Okay, it could be um, eight fifty, or it could be ten. The fact is, I've got a. This is a function, so v is a function. V is a function, and s is a number. And both of these, I'm going to sit in the S-bond and plan and, and figure out before I get off the train. Okay? And I'm going to, we're, in the next hour, we're going we're to derive this. I'm going to go slowly, we're, and it, it's really a cool idea. The idea is VS solves a problem, which is I want to minimize the cost of, or the, the price that I have in expectation of a strategy comparing what I have in my hand, which is S, and the possibility of going and searching a bit more. Okay, so it's again, it's explicitly sequential, because I, I and that's the way Sargent always says, you have S in hand, so the guy is quoting your price, and you have to decide uh, whether I keep looking or not. Okay, so I'm gonna write down that problem. It's, it's, not, it's not hard, and the diagram is very easy. When I do the diagram next week, I wait till next week to do it. It's very easy, and it basically it captures all the logic. You don't have to do. You don't have to think about the math too much right now. Okay, so here's the question: What is the expected value of the price and the search cost when I have S in hand? I'm, I'm, I'm just talking to this guy, and he says I'm going to charge you eight euros a kilo, and I can either do the, I can do two things. I can say I go for it. I take it. You give them the money and that's it. Or I say, no, I'm going to go visit another one. One other store, just one. Because I've already visited maybe a bunch. But right now it's just a, it's basically a decision, do I accept S in my hand, I've got S in hand, or do I reject S, pay C, same search cost, and then go to the next guy that I won't run into. So I walk down the, to the next uh, stand. Okay, so just think of that logic. It's just a yes-no decision. Yes, no. Do it, don't do it. I'm not choosing N star or whatever. I'm just, I'm actually, so VS will be defined by that decision. VS will actually be defined by that, that um, to use the German, Abwägung, right? So I've got, I've got V of S, and it's defined as the min over the set reject or accept. So it's a zero one decision. What am I minimizing? Well, there are two possibilities. One possibility is this, this computer will finally stop or stop. I'll cut them off like this. like a hack. Someone's hacked my computer. All right, so I'm going to minimize the following. S or, remember, I accept and I pay S or I reject. I don't get S and I have to pay C because I have to walk to the next guy. And what do I get? I get the expected value What do you think? If you get this, you got it. Okay. If you get this, you got it. What am I? What am I expecting? Yeah. No. So remember, I, I go, the guy says eight, and I say, hmm. Okay. Either I take it. That would mean that that this eight is lower than my reservation price, which I haven't derived yet, I'm going to derive it. Or I walk to the next guy, and I don't know what he's going to say. So how would you characterize the expected value of that? What do I get if I walk to the next guy, the next stand? Doesn't it sound a little bit like what I just did? It's a, re it's a repeat. It's a recursive problem. I'm just repeating the whole thing again. So it's the expected value of a function that we just defined. S prime? Huh? Something like S prime? Exactly. It's not S anymore because I know what S is. I just got it. Okay, but it's some unknown value S prime. 
Call it S prime. You can call it anything you want. You can call it P if you want. But I'm going to use S prime because that's what the notation in this uh, Sargent book does. It's, it's very beautiful. Okay? So that, this, this is, again, it's a minimum. I have two choices. Accept. This is accept. I take the eight, eight euros a kilo. Or I say I'm going to take my chances. And this means reject. So you see, if I reject, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to pay C even if I get a great price. So I'm always dealing with this extra cost of going to the next stand. That's C. So in the labor market, that's going to be the cost of doing another interview, another assessment center, all that stuff. Okay? But the, problem, the interesting thing, this problem is, is on its head. I'm trying to get the minimum price. When you're out in the labor market, you're trying to get the best wage you can. Okay? But the logic is exactly the same. It's just flipped. And I think this is a really nice way to get you motivated because Stigler, you know, started with this this n star problem, and um, all we have to do now is characterize this problem, and it's really not hard. All you have to it's the graphical representation is even better than the mathematical one. To get the mathematical one, we're going to have to use the integral to evaluate that expectation. Okay, but the, the, again, the key thing is recursive the recursiveness of the problem. And what does that mean? That means this S is defined as something that is a function of S, of, of, of V. This, this V function calls on itself. And this problem will give rise to the reservation price that makes me just indifferent between accepting and rejecting. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave you with that thought. The reservation price as prime is the one that makes me indifferent, just indifferent, between accepting and rejecting. So it's a corner. It's going to be like a corner in a diagram. And you can show it formally in the rest. So I'll leave you with that. And once you get that, you're set because the this is looking for the lowest price. When you're in the labor market, you're looking for the best wage, you're trying to maximize your expected lifetime earnings or expected lifetime, expected earnings for the next job. So you're solving a max problem that flips this literally in the other direction. Okay, I apologize profusely for the crappy um, quality, but um, maybe, maybe you were right, maybe it's just a calibration problem. I thought I fixed it, but obviously it doesn't seem to work. It has to do with putting my, fit, my fist here. <laughs> okay. Then see you next week.